Welcome to Easy Postcard Creation with Adobe InDesign for nonprofits and libraries. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup Global. And I'm happy to be your host for today's webinar. You'll also be hearing from our in-house expert, resident expert on Adobe InDesign, who, Wes Holing, who is a senior web content developer here at TechSoup Global. And he writes about Adobe for TechSoup, contributes to TechSoup's design team, and started with kind of experience as trial and error, hacking his way through design, and has now come out the other side as an expert in this area, creating content and how-tos like a recent series he wrote for us on Intro to Photoshop for Nonprofits, and also ran a webinar with us a month or so ago on Adobe Photoshop tips for, web for nonprofits. You'll see in the back end assisting with chat, Wes White and Ali Bezdikian from TechSoup. You may also see Sun Park from TechSoup or Terry McGrath from Adobe. We're glad to have them on the back end to help field your questions. We are all here in our San Francisco headquarters office, and Terry's not far away either. In, I'm not sure if you're in Mountain View, but you're in Northern California as well. Go ahead and chat in to let us know where you're joining from today. And while you do that, I'll go over the agenda. We'll do an introduction to TechSoup. We'll have one moment of taking a poll question to get your experience with desktop publishing already, which tools you've, you're most familiar with. We'll talk briefly about the Adobe Creative Cloud subscription and the Adobe Donation Program through TechSoup. We'll talk a little bit about where InDesign shines, and then Wes will open up to a live walkthrough of designing a postcard that you can use. And this is an example because we know nonprofits use postcards for save the dates, use them like brochures just to gauge interest, use them for invitations for your events. But you can also use double-sided print collateral like this to create bookmarks, to create brochures, to create all kinds of print collateral. And so we wanted to take you through this, give you some templates to start with, and really just walk through how to put together something simple, classic, easy, that you can then customize for your own organization's needs. He'll also give you a glossary of some terms to know, talk about some best practices for working with printers, and we'll share additional resources and a little bit more about that Adobe contest. We'll have time for Q&A, so feel free to ask those questions as they come in. And we will also, uh, just to make sure that people are aware, we're also on the line here. We advertise that it's 75 minutes, but we can stay up to 90 minutes to answer your questions. So if you can only stay with us for an hour, Never fear, you'll get the recording and, and all the details later. But we'd love it if you can stay for the full period so we can answer all of your questions. TechSoup Global is a nonprofit serving nonprofits around the world in 120 countries. You can learn more about our programs in our 2014 Year in Review. But we are serving organizations in six, with 63 partners around the world in 120 some countries serving 615,000 NGOs worldwide to the tune of nearly $5 billion in donations, products, and grants for the greater good. You can learn more about these programs at TechSoup.org. Before we jump into Adobe InDesign, I want to ask what programs have you been using for desktop publishing or layout or design? Click any that apply to your organization's needs and that you've used previously. This just helps us get an idea of what your experience level may be. Maybe you're already using InDesign. Maybe you've been relying on programs you already have on your computer like Word or Google Docs. Or maybe you're using mostly online photo or reservation sites like Shutterfly or Evite or you know, Walgreens or Costco Photo, and you're using templates that they have online that you can just fill in the blanks and, and email. Um, and maybe trying to print those out. People are mentioning in the chat as well, Illustrator, PageMaker, Photoshop, PDF Editor through Adobe, Vistaprint, Dreamweaver, PowerPoint for layout. So a lot of tools that maybe aren't always intended to do page layout or desktop publishing. We know those often get used for it. Having been uh, on staff at small nonprofits, I'm one of those people that used whatever I had available. So this is helpful to get your feedback so we have an understanding of who's been using InDesign and who's been using other programs. 
So far it looks like the great majority of you have used Microsoft Word and Publisher. Not surprising since that is kind of ubiquitous Office installed software that most organizations have access to. You'll find that uh, Microsoft Word is not actually a desktop publishing or layout program, but it, yeah, it does have some ability to plop some things in the page and adjust them. Microsoft Publisher is actually meant for desktop publishing, but it is a bit more restricted and limited. Adobe InDesign uh, and some of these other programs that are a little bit more um, designed specifically for desktop publishing offer a lot more flexibility in helping you design exactly what you want and have it come out hopefully the way you really want. So thank you all for your feedback on that. Before we have Wes start with his tour, I just want to take a moment to share details on the Adobe Creative Cloud offer and donation program. For those of you who are interested in it, we have a couple of different programs through TechSoup. One is our traditional donation program where a narrower scope of primarily nonprofit organizations, C3 organizations can access individually installed desktop software like Adobe Acrobat for Windows, Acrobat for Mac, or Photoshop Elements and Premiere Elements. These are available to that same crowd that has kind of always been able to access them as a donation. Now just recently in the past couple of months, Adobe has also started offering an individual membership with a discounted rate. So this is a new program that is open to all organization types, whether you are a C3 nonprofit or a public library. And this $5 admin fee gets you access to a 60% discounted rate of $239 per year, and then that switches to a 40% off the retail rate every year after that for individual memberships. So if you are interested in accessing Adobe InDesign um, as part of this bigger Creative Cloud suite of products that they make available, this is the way to do it at this point. Uh, we no longer have individually installed Adobe desktop products aside from these ones in our donation program right now. So keep that in mind. Uh, the Adobe Creative Cloud program includes all of these different uh, elements and products from Photoshop to Lightroom to Illustrator, InDesign, and more. So you can see there's a long list there. I won't go through all of it, but just so you know what's available. And again, here's the details that, these, uh, that this individual membership access discount rate 60% off for the first year for a TechSoup admin fee of $5 per membership. And you can get as many memberships as you need. So unlike the traditional program, that was a donation. You could only access you know, one or two or three products per year. You can get as many of those as you want. These are uh, myths about how this works. So if you're not familiar with Creative Cloud, this helps debunk a little bit of the, the mythology that you're still able to run these on your desktop. You're just getting updates through the cloud. I'm not going to go through all of these, but they are included in the slide deck. So if you have questions about the program, it's there for you. I attached these slides to the final reminder and confirmation emails, so you should be able to open these up and read through them at your convenience. And again, all budget sizes are eligible. All 501c3 organizations and public libraries are eligible, and you can request an unlimited number of individual memberships. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and switch us over. Switch us over. Having, having Great, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and uh, switch over to uh, our slides here. So uh, I, as uh, Becky mentioned, uh, my name is Wes. I, I work here at TechSoup on uh, a, lot of, a lot of Adobe uh, content and um, I do some graphic design work as well. So uh, we, you may have previously joined us for my last webinar on Photoshop. So I'm uh, happy to join you again today uh, talking about InDesign. So first I'd like to mention uh, when is a good time to use InDesign versus another uh, Adobe product, for example. Um, 
I know a lot of folks had mentioned that they'd used Word, for example, or a publisher. Uh, and there's, there's no shame in using anything uh, that's not necessarily a uh, desktop publishing program for desktop publishing. We all have to start somewhere. Uh, the nice thing about Adobe InDesign, though, is the level of control that it gives you over the, the final product that you produce. So uh, if you are producing print collateral and you want it to match your brand or a certain feel or something, and the templates that are built into the programs that you're using uh, don't quite match that InDesign gives you that level of control that you can make it match exactly what you want, or you know even try new things and see see how uh, your your constituents resonate with with what you're producing. So uh, let's go and skip ahead uh, just to compare it to a few other uh, uh, Creative Cloud applications you might be familiar with. Uh, Photoshop is great for things like editing images, creating photos, making uh, web banners or you know advertisements, things like that, uh, and designing mockups. Um, and Illustrator is another great tool from uh, Adobe that's also in the Creative Cloud that's uh, more useful for creating logos and, and scalable artwork. And by scalable artwork, I mean something like an illustration that you can blow up to a, a large size without losing quality. Uh, InDesign, though, is best for making print and interactive documents. And what I mean by that is just a, a standard print document like a postcard that we're making today or a document, a uh, printed document like a brochure. You can also create interactive documents. We won't be covering any of that today, but things like uh, including hyperlinks in that to your website that you can distribute the whole document as like a PDF, for example. Uh, you can have interactive elements like video within PDF. Uh, things like that are, are really handy if, it's, if you're uh, emailing something, you know, to to uh, prospective uh, donors, things like that. So uh, the nice thing about all these applications though is that they all work together so well. So you can create uh, a logo in, in Illustrator and uh, touch up a photo in Photoshop and then place all of those in your document in InDesign. And, and as Becky mentioned, uh, the Creative Cloud offer that TechSoup provides uh, includes all of these products you know, in the Creative Cloud and then many, many more, things that also all work together very nicely. So just a quick heads up on, on what InDesign is good for and, and what other programs are better for. But uh, with all that said, let's, uh, let's make a postcard. So I'm going to go ahead and share uh, my computer. Let me switch over here. So hopefully you can all see what, uh, what I'm looking at right now, which is just a basic uh, InDesign uh, application. Um, I know I, I noticed a couple of folks in the, in the chat window had mentioned that the template that we sent out earlier was for the current version of, of uh, InDesign Creative Cloud. Um, I will uh, export uh, this, uh, this file as, uh, as a, uh, one open for, for earlier versions if anyone is having trouble and wants to start making this postcard, but I'll only be able to do that after the webinar unfortunately. So we'll, we, can, we can provide that later. Uh, so my, my apologies for, for not considering the CS6, 5, 4, etc. folks. Uh, but in the meantime, um, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through creating a postcard with InDesign Creative Cloud. A lot of the, uh, the things that I'll be covering today are universal for um, many of the more recent versions of, of InDesign. So uh, just creating documents, placing in, you know, objects in them, adding text, formatting the text, all this is very basic InDesign stuff. So if you've never used InDesign before and you don't have the latest version, it should still be covered. And I'll be sure to mention things if there's any that uh, are specific to the latest version of InDesign, but hopefully we won't run into too many of those. So uh, first thing, we're going to create a new document. If you have the template, go ahead and leave it open. I'm going to walk through a few things uh, to get other people to that point, uh, but then we're going to jump right into to the template. So for creating a new document, it's just like you would expect from the File menu, uh, and then there's New. In this case, we're creating a document. In most cases, you'll just be creating documents. There are options for creating books and libraries, which are more collections of other documents. We're not going to be touching any of that, but uh, today, just creating a document. Um, one thing to consider is that by default, InDesign uses uh, picas for its measurement. And that sounds like a little technical, but basically what it means is instead of using inches or centimeters, it's using picas, which is a, a, a publishing measurement. The great thing about InDesign and, and all the uh, Adobe uh, applications though is you can enter one measurement and it will automatically convert it for you. So in this case, we're going to be creating a uh, 6 inch by 4 inch postcard. And if you have the template, you can see that there's already uh, a, a 6 by 4 inch uh, postcard create laid out. But I'll go ahead and enter these values here. So we have uh, 6 inches by 4 inches. 
and we want two pages in this case because it's going to be a double-sided postcard. It seems kind of counterintuitive that there's one page technically with two sides, but in this case we're creating two pages. And down here in the margins, I'm going to specify that as a quarter inch all around. Now if you'll notice I entered a quarter inch in the top. Uh, this lock icon, and if I hover over it will tell me, make all settings the same. So once I enter a value here and then switch on to something else, they all change. And if you, as you see they've all converted to Pikas uh, automatically. Now if I'm not quite sure how this is going to look in the end, I'm not ready to commit. There's the preview right down here, and I can see it pop up right behind me. That looks good. The, the margins aren't too, you know, too far in, too far out. It looks like the right, you know, the right scale that I want, and I can just click OK. Now, that's for creating a basic document. You can see if I scroll down, and this might lag a little for folks, so I apologize, but if I scroll down and over, there's the other page. Now, that's kind of awkward to use. Up here in the Pages flyout, you see there's the one page and the second page. It's, it's great when you're working with something like this where you can bring everything together, see it all at once, instead of having to scroll around. So in order to, to, to make it a little more easy to use, I can click this flyout right up here and uncheck Allow Document Pages to Shuffle. So if I uncheck that, obviously nothing happens, but that allows me to click this second page, drag it over, and you can, if you can see there's a bracket that just appeared once I connected two to one. So I let go from here. Now we've got this nice clean presentation. I can see the, the front side. I can see the back side. They're right next to each other. And I can line things up if I need to. It works a lot better. Now from here, what I would recommend is to create uh, guides. And this is where the template file comes in. So again, apologies for anyone who's not working with Creative Cloud version. If you still have CS6 or CS5, for example, um, and you can't open the file, my apologies. Uh, I'm going to switch over to the template file which has these guides already added just in the sake of time because I don't want to spend a lot of time having you watch me just drag guides around. But let me go ahead and open up the template. And I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see what's going on here. That's an excellent question. Uh, so one thing I was going to cover at the end of this webinar are some best practices for working with your printer. But uh, since you brought it up at the beginning, it's a great time to talk about it. Uh, I'll touch on it briefly. Um, I would recommend always talking to the printer that you're going to use, if you're going to use a printer beforehand, to make sure you're providing something that they can print from. In a lot of cases, uh, you will need to create a bleed. And if you're not familiar with what a bleed is, it's when uh, your, your, your object on the page goes beyond the edge of the page. So at a printer, uh, you know, they'll, they'll cut the sheet uh, to the dimensions that you want. So sometimes you'll need something to go over that edge just to make sure that it doesn't you know, cut short. So uh, if, you're going, if you know that your, your, uh, your printer needs, let's say, a, a one-inch bleed, that's, the, that's a great time to, to enter that. And you'll see in InDesign, uh, right past the, the edge of the actual page, you'll see a, a line that connects around. I didn't include one here, so it's not visible in this case. But if you were to specify one, it would be visible there. Uh, and again, that's something that you, know, you want to check with the printer beforehand just to be sure that you're matching their, their specifications. You don't have to go back and fix something later, or, or you get a, a product that doesn't look right. So uh, excellent question. So as I mentioned, uh, I skipped over to our template. Uh, it, it's identical to what I just created previously, uh, except there's these, these lines that kind of intersect all over the, the both, both pages. And of course, the left is the front and the right is the back. Um, and I wanted to just skip to this in order to save the time of having you having, you having to watch me uh, drag guides around. So uh, with those in place, 
Uh, I'm going to uh, show you how to do one other thing. I mentioned at the top that uh, InDesign's default is to use picas instead of inches. Um, I'm uh, an American guy. I don't think in terms of anything but the standard measurements. Uh, I don't do metric. So uh, I'll show you how to switch over to inches, which might be something a little more familiar to you as it is to me. So um, up here in the Edit menu, come down to Preferences. And you can see there's a lot of options, as I mentioned before. InDesign gives you a lot of control over every aspect. We're going to go up to in, uh, Units and Increments. So we click on that. You can see uh, in this top section here there are ruler units uh, for horizontal and vertical. Um, for the, the template, I've already specified inches. But if you already, but if you have picas still chosen, you can see it might be checked. You can just change that one to inches for both of these. You're set for inches. Now if I create any object on the page, if I add a rectangle, a circle, if I want to measure out some, a text box, it's all going to pop up in inches and, and it's easy enough for me to understand. So uh, let's go ahead and get started adding some things to our, our, uh, our template. The first thing I'm going to do is to create a, um, a, a background color. Um, we mentioned at the top that uh, this is where you would want to include your bleed if you do need one. I'm not going to add one here because obviously this is just a demo. I'm not going to send it to, to a printer. But if you did, you would measure this to, to your bleed. So we just click over here to the rectangle tool. You can see there's a fly out. If you hold it down, you have other options for, for an ellipse, which is you know, just a circle. A polygon tool, you can create uh, you know, shapes like uh, triangles, um, pentagons, and so on for other geometric shapes. We're just going to be using our uh, standard rectangle tool. So click that. Down here we're going to choose, uh, we, we have the option for colors. Uh, you can see the, 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 the upper left box is for fill, and the bottom right box is for stroke. We can choose the color that we want uh, in a number of ways. Uh, we have swatches over here which give you pre-selected uh, standard colors, or you can just choose your own color here in the color box. With the template what's nice is I've created a postcard folder down here at the bottom with all the colors that we'll be using today. Now, again, if you're not working from the template, no sweat. Feel free to pick your own colors as you go. It's, you know, it's just a demo. You can always change them later. There's nothing that's uh, set in stone. Uh, but if you are working from the template, I'll tell you which ones we're picking as we go. So I've chosen uh, a rectangle, and I'm going to use the color uh, Tana, which is right here. Uh, and one other word about color, if you don't know which colors to use, there are some great uh, assets online for choosing um, uh, palettes. Uh, Design Seeds is one, and then we'll have links to these at the end that will show you uh, uh, colors that all look nice together if you're looking for a certain aesthetic. Uh, with the latest version of Creative Cloud, there's actually a uh, color themes option. If you go up to the Window menu, go to Color, and then this option here, Adobe Color Themes, it will bring up this, uh, this little palette where you can create your own based on whatever it is you're looking for, complementary colors, uh, contrasting colors based on a certain color, that sort of thing. You can also, uh, what I did in order to choose uh, colors for, for this presentation, I just came and explored one. I found this neutral blue section which I thought was nice. It's, um, and these are all the colors that are listed here in this color uh, postcard folder. So, uh, I'm going to close out of that color themes, but I just want to make you aware of that because it's, it's really handy if you're not good at coming up with colors that work together uh, as I am. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to create a rectangle again using the rectangle tool from the swatches uh, flyout. Uh, this postcard box, I'm choosing Tana. And it's as simple as, as you've used in, in, uh, in, if you've used uh, Publisher for example, it's just clicking and dragging from one corner to the other. And as you can see, it tells me from that tool tip before I let go, 6 inches and 4 inches is exactly what I want. So we've created our background color just for the left side. I'm not going to create one for the right side, and I'll get into more of that later. But now we're going to uh, add that description. So if I click the text, what I'll do is if I choose text here, I can choose from character on the right side. And again, if you don't have any of these options, they're all available under Window. You can choose character from type and tables, or if you want your, your right side to look just like mine, this, uh, this box up here will give you options for a workspace. You can choose, I've chosen typography because it gives me a lot more options that I'm going to work with. Uh, depending on what your needs are, you can choose other ones. But if just choosing typography from this upper one here will give you all the options that I have on the right. So, um, so from here, after we've chosen uh, the text tool, I can choose character. 
me switch over. There we go. After I've chosen <laughs> but sorry, that's at the type tool, I can choose my uh, my font. Um, if you've already installed the two fonts that I recommended beforehand, I'm going to use Open Sans. Uh, if you haven't you installed the fonts that, that we recommended, that's fine too. You can use whatever font you like. Open Sans is a sans serif font. It looks a little like um, like Arial if you're familiar with that one. But again, it's whatever your tastes are, so don't feel like you have to use the fonts that I've, I've recommended. But if you click from that uh, drop down, you can scroll alphabetically of course, down to Open Sans, and there it is. There's also this little uh, drop down box here. You can choose variants of it if you want it light, if you want it bold, if you want italic, etc. I'm just going to use uh, bold, and I'm going to choose 12 point. One thing I like to do in uh, in, in InDesign is to create objects off of the page and then drag them in. That's because InDesign is, a, is unique in that it will, you can create frames and add text to them. It can get a little confusing. So in, in, for the examples that I'll be doing here, I'll be creating things off the page and then dragging them in. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to click and drag just up here. Let go. And I can just type a fundraising event to support our mission. This is Terrible copy. It won't convince anyone. Uh, of course, you should change this to whatever your mission is. If it's uh, helping youth, if it's saving the environment, whatever it is, whatever you think will compel people. This is just for me to uh, to cover my bases for for any nonprofits and libraries. Um, so we're going to drag this down once we've created it to so this guide here. Hopefully, you can see that. What we're going to do is drag the box the text frame to the very edge of it, beyond the margin. Uh, the reason we are going to do that is so that uh, when we add the background color, it will expand to the full width of the, of the postcard. But I will get into that in a moment. Uh, from here, we will uh, we'll, we'll create, we'll, we'll uh, widen it so that it matches on both sides, both edges of the, of the postcard. So that looks okay. That doesn't look great right now. What we are going to do is uh, we are going to choose some text frame options. The reason for this is you can manipulate how the text looks within the box that it, that it resides in. To do that, we right click on it and then choose text frame options. And we are going to be coming back to this a lot for each text item that we add. So we choose text frame options. We have a lot of options here. I'm going to go, just go over a few of these. You don't have to worry about all of them. And feel free to check the preview box down here so you can see as, as, it, as you change it how it will look if it's not checked already. Um, the inset spacing here in the middle uh, is basically just think of that as, as your margins within the box. What we are going to do is specify that as 0.1 inches for top and for bottom, and a quarter inch on the left and a quarter inch on the right. Now if you can see over here in the preview, it's moved the, the text over to the, uh, to the margin, which as we specified in the beginning was uh, just a quarter inch. So we, we, we use that here as well. It brings it in to, to, to line up with the margin. And we've added just a tenth of an inch on top and bottom, just a little, a little breathing room. We're also going to change the vertical alignment to center. That will bring the text within the, the middle vertically of, of the box. Up here, uh, in baseline options, the very top, I'm going to choose that. And these, I'm basically only going to cover like three options throughout the text frame options. So if this seems like a lot, I apologize. We're going to keep revisiting them. But we'll change the offset from ascent to cap height. Now what is this? This basically means that it, the text frame is taking into account uh, the, 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 the height of the capital letters in there rather than adding some space on the top which comes naturally with the font. We're going to avoid that extra space. We're just going to focus on the, the actual height of the capital letters in, in the text. Nothing changed here, but you'll see more drastic results later. So you can click OK on that. One nice thing about Adobe uh, products in general is when you create uh, an object on a page, if you uh, double click any of the, the, the uh, resizer boxes, it will resize the, op uh, the, the object to match the, uh, the exact uh, size of, of what's inside them. So if, you're, if you have text within a box, if I double click this bottom hanger, you can see that it shrinks up to match the exact height. We still have that padding though that we created, which is really nice. It, it gives a little breathing room when we add the color. So speaking of color, we're going to change the color of the background and of the text. Um, now if, we, if you remember from earlier, the back, uh, on, on the bottom left here, there's the fill color, which is chosen. And if I come back up to my swatches, 
on the right. Scroll down. This time I'm going to choose uh, Big Stone, which is the, the darkest color. That looks good. The big text is impossible to read. When you have text within a frame, you can choose the color of the frame and you can choose the color of the text. And this is a, a mistake I make a lot when I'm working in design. I just have to undo, choose text, change the color. So in order to do that, on the bottom left here, there's this box which says Formatting Effects Container, and then one that says uh, for one that has the T, which means it will affect the text. So if we choose that, and then choose a different color. In this case, I'm going to choose Ceramic which is the lightest color in, in, in the swatches. Now we can see the text against the dark background. Now I'll click off of that and you can see how that looks. Not bad. That's, it, it's bold. It, 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 it's called out, but it's not going to be the biggest and, and most uh, heavy thing on, on the, the postcard. At this point we're going to add the logo, a background for our logo. And it's basically going to be the same thing as creating the, the text frame. We're going to click the rectangle tool again. We're going to make sure that we have the foreground uh, checked, which we do. And in this case, I'm going to choose Big Stone to match the colors of uh, the, the background of the, of the description. And I'm going to click outside the, the, the page again. Just one click. I don't have to click and drag because I have specific measurements that I want. So I'm going to click it. It will give me options for the size. I'll choose 1.35 inches by 1.25 inches, which is just going to be slightly wider than it is tall. There we go. And if I choose the pointer tool, I can just drag that right to the top of the margins, and it'll click in right there, and it lines up with the margins that we the uh, the guides that we've already specified to. So now that we've got that, let's try placing our logo. So we're going to place an object on the page that comes from another file. Now in this case I've created a logo in Illustrator that just serves as sort of a dummy logo for the organization. This will work uh, all perfectly the same if you have, let's say, a photo or just anything else like a PDF that you want to place inside another PDF. Whatever you can place within InDesign that's an, ex that's an external file, uh, this, you would use the same process. So we're going to go up to the File menu and Place. Now from here, let me switch off to the actual thing I'm talking about. Sorry about that. Uh, here's my files. I'm going to choose the logo EPS. This is another file that we attached in the email we sent out earlier. So I'll go ahead and click that and then just choose Open. Now as you can see, it changes my cursor to have a, a little arrow with a dotted line and a picture of a picture. It's asking me where I want to place it. You can place it as its own object, or you can place it within another object, which in this case I've created that background and I'm going to place it uh, inside of it. So if I just click inside the rectangle, you can see that the cursor changes slightly. So now that those dotted lines are around the picture, which means I'm going to place it inside something else. So I can click that. There we go. There's my, there's my logo. Now it looks kind of jagged. And the first maybe six months of using InDesign, I always wondered why do all my pictures look, look pixelated or just crummy. Um, InDesign thinks ahead that you may be placing a lot of things on a page and it might slow down your performance. So it will display things in a lower resolution way. Uh, you can have it specify, you can tell InDesign to, to, to show it to you, uh, you know, a, as it actually is though if you want, uh, by going up to the View menu to display performance. As you can see, typical display is chosen. This is sort of a middle ground. Fast display will show no images. High quality display will show images in full resolution. So we can choose that. Now our logo looks, looks nice and clean and sharp. I prefer to do it this way. My computer can handle showing an image, as most of yours probably can too. But once you add a lot of things, it can begin to slow down. It's a nice, a nice way to, to work quickly. Um, so from here we're going to add the organization name right below it. We're going to click the text tool come back over to character, just like we did before when we added the description. This time I'm going to use uh, Vesper Libre, which is the other font that we recommended. Choose this. And again, you can choose whatever font you want. The, the default, uh, I, think, I believe, is uh, Minion Pro. You can use that. It's a nice uh, serif font. So I'm going to choose uh, Vesper Libre. Bring the drop down. I'm going to choose Regular. And I'm going to make it slightly smaller than the description. You don't want it to compete for attention. I'm going to choose this as 10 points. 
Up here you can also see once we've chosen character there are options for justification. So if you are used to Word for example, you choose left, center, right, we have a lot of the same options and then you have others as well. I'm just going to cover those basic ones here. But in this case we are going to choose center alignment. So we click that right in the upper right. And then uh, I'm going to create a text frame again off of the, off of the postcard by clicking and dragging. The size doesn't matter. We can always resize it. Just click and drag and let go. And then I'll, choose, and I'll just type organization name. A boring name for an organization. You know, again, feel free to, to enter yours here. Of course you'd want to make it personal. So we've chosen that. Now I'm going to change the color of it. And again, before I just go and choose a color that will change the background, I want to come down to the bottom left, click the T, which will change will affect the text. Choose that. And then from my swatches panel again, I'm going to choose again big stone so that the color of the of the text will match the background color, will match the background of the, of the description. We have kind of a, a consistent color scheme going. You don't want to choose too many colors, it becomes kind of distracting, you get that rainbow effect. So I've chosen that. Now I'm going to go back to my text frame options just like we did before by right clicking it. Text frame options. Uh, the inset spacing, just like we did with our description, I'm going to add just the same amount. So I'm going to select it. I'm going to choose 0.1 inches. 0.1 inches. We've got that little border above and below. I'm going to choose the same thing as I did before. I'm going to choose a center uh, justification. And then from our baseline options, you can see that unlike with Open Sans, this font, Vesper Libra, when I chose, I'll go back and I'll, I'll re-demonstrate that in case you missed it. When it was on top uh, and I chose center, you can watch organization name will shift down. That's because the font includes some extra space on top just naturally. Um, you can overcome that by choosing baseline options and changing ascent to cap height. That's what we did before with the description, and that will only focus on the letters themselves and none of the other stuff that may come just built into the font that you may not want. And again, this is a great example of InDesign giving you total control over whatever it is you're putting on a page and however you want it to look. So once we've chosen that, just click OK. And I'm going to drag this down right below. I'm going to click on that right hanger and drag it over. So now it's lined up right underneath the, the logo. Uh, just like we did with the description, I've got the little hangers on there and I can double click the bottom one. It will shrink it right up. It doesn't shrink it up right, the text right to the object because we added that, that spacing. We added that top and bottom so nothing will, will, you know, will interfere. It's not, you're going to have a little breathing room for what it is you've typed. So we've got our logo, we've got our name, and we've got our description. We're going to move on to adding that big call out on the right which is the title of the postcard. So that the text that I've chosen is a night to eat, drink, and give. Um, you know, of course it can be whatever it is you want. Uh, I figured that was a good opportunity to send an invitation to folks to come out to an event that's got maybe a dinner and a reception and then an opportunity for them to give to your organization or library. So we're going to add a night to as a separate object, eat, drink, as a separate object and then and give because they all have different text treatments. We want things to line up differently. We don't want anything to be confusing on the page. So first thing is to add a night to. We're going to click the type tool once again. I'm going to come back down to my character palette. I've got best for Libra chosen, which is great. That's what I want. Regular, perfect. We're going to create slightly larger text, 12 point. If you think about font size uh, as which thing should be loudest, you know, volume-wise, uh, we've got 10 point, which is for the organization name. It's smaller. It's just to describe what the, what the logo is above it. We have a slightly larger one for the description. That's nice. This one's going to be on the same level. A night two is not nearly as important as eat drink, which is not nearly as important as and give. I mean, of course, giving is the most important thing. You want that to be the most noticeable thing. So we're going to start with a 12 point font in this case. Uh, we're going to create the text frame again off of the postcard, just clicking and dragging. And I'll type a night two. Uh, as you can see, it's still centered from before, so I can choose left alignment in the upper right, which we did before when we chose the center alignment. Now we can choose align left. Click that. The text shifts over. Um, and now I'm going to change the color. If I click the selection tool, I can accept the, the, the text change that I made and then come back down to the T down here in the bottom left, which will, uh, the formatting will affect the text rather than the box that it's in. I will choose one of my swatches, and this time I'm going to choose the color called William. It's kind of hard to read against that background, but once we drag it over, 
we'll be able to see it. But before we do, let's right click. Let's we'll choose text frame options. I think you can see where this is going. Uh, we're going to choose our baseline options. We're going to choose cap height as we did before. Now you can see barely maybe that uh, text brought up right to the top. I click OK. Now I'm going to drag this to this spot here. Now the box extends beyond that margin. We can just drag that margin, uh, the, 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 the frame of the or the edge of the frame right up to that margin. Now we've got a night two resting comfortably right there. And I will even drag this out to the margin just for uh, just to be anal retentive about it. Um, the next thing we'll add is the words eat, comma, drink, comma. So I'm going to do the same thing before. I choose the text tool. I change my font in this case down in the character palette. It's still Vesper Libre. That's great. Uh, Vesper Libre comes with uh, four options for weight. We have regular, which you know, the normal font you're used to seeing as far as thickness. There's medium, which is not quite bold, not quite regular. This is uh, what other fonts might call a semi-bold. Uh, regular bold, as you're familiar with, and heavy, which is uh, you know, somewhere one step beyond bold. So in this case, we're going to choose medium. We want it to be slightly larger and slightly heavier than a knight too, just so that it's got you know, that much more weight on the page. Uh, in this case, we're going to let's see. Let me look at my notes. Uh, 36 point font, which is you know three times the size, which is great. And we're going to create a big text frame up here. In fact, the one I created was not large enough. I'm going to undo Control Z. I'm going to create this off to the side. I'm scrolling over, so sorry if that's going to lag and, and be hard to see. But now I've got some extra space. I can create an even bigger text box that I can work from. So I'll click and drag this big one, and I'll type eat, comma, drink, comma. Of course, an extra comma is the serial comma because I believe in that. I apologize for anyone who does not like the Oxford comma. Uh, no more talk of text. Let's keep let's keep designing. Uh, so we've chosen. We've, we've typed our text. And I'm going to left align this one as well. Click left align. And I'm going to choose down here in the bottom left. Again, we're going to change the color. We have to choose that we're going to change the, the text color rather than the box color first. Choose that. Up to swatches. Scroll down. This time I'm going to choose William again so that it matches a knight too. Although it's, it's bigger and heavier, it's still got the same consistent color. I'm going to click the selection tool. We're going to drag this over so that it lines up right underneath a night two, and we've got it in our, in our margins. We drag the corner of this so that it lines up within the box so it doesn't intrude on anything else. That looks okay, but again, we need to change a few things in our text frame options. So we right click, text frame options, and I'm going to choose our baseline options, change that to cap height. Now it's up top. That's great. Okay. Now that looks that looks good. It's bigger. It's a little, it's a little louder, but I want it to be even louder. One thing we can do is we come down to the char uh, back down to the character uh, fly or uh, a palette. We choose on the upper right all the uh, the palettes all have these little flyout menus which have options on top of the options that you can already see. And this is true for a lot of Adobe products. If you click that, you get extra options. In this case, I want to choose all caps. Okay. Now in this case, you can see that drink has disappeared. What you can see is a red plus sign right here. If I drag this edge off a little farther, I can see there's drink. It's, it's too far beyond the margin. The font's the right size that I want though. So what, what can I do? I can drag this back over a little farther. Now it fits in there. That looks good. I'm going to drag a knight to over as well. Now they line up. Everything fits. It's the right size that I want. Everyone's happy. Um, now we're going to add and give right below it. So I'm going to scroll back over to where I have some space. I'm going to create a big text box here. But before I do, before I type anything, let's change the character size to 12. Now it seems kind of weird because we have give being the biggest element on the page. But we're also going to have and in there. And you don't want and to have equal weight to give. So I'm going to choose 12 point font. We're going to choose regular. 
and we're going to left align this. All the stuff we've done before. We're going to type and and space. Now I'm going to choose heavy, which is of course the, the heaviest weight of all. I'm going to change the font size to really big, 72. I'm going to type give. Now within the same text frame you can change certain properties like the all caps. So I'm going to change, I'm going to select it within the box. I'm going to choose that fly out again, all caps. Now it's extra big. And while it's selected, I go to my swatches. I choose, uh, let's see, big stone, which is the dark color we've used for the background of the description, the background of the logo, and the organization name text. I click off of that within the box. That looks good. And I can choose and and change its color too. So we've got two colors, two font sizes, two font weights, all within the same box. And I'm going to choose William, which is the color that we use for a night to eat and drink. Looks good. I'm going to click the selection tool to accept the changes. And of course, it wouldn't be creating a text frame without uh, changing our text frame options. I can right click that, choose text frame options. I'm going to align this to the bottom, and you'll see why in a moment. And let's change our uh, uh, offset <coughs> excuse me, to uh, cap height, as we did with all the other ones. I'm going to resize this down a bit. It's a little large. Drag it in. I'm going to line up the bottom right of this box with the bottom right over here. I'm going to drag this to the uh, 3 inches by almost half inch uh, side along the way. Now we kind of lost our, our text here. I'm going to drag it up a little farther. There we go. That looks pretty good. So we've got a night to eat, drink, and give. Now the reason that I aligned it to the bottom is when I click off of this, and if I hide our, uh, our, our guides for just a moment and our text frame borders, you can see, I'm going to scroll over so you can see a little better. Give is the same color as the, as the, as the description box, and it rests right on top of it. Uh, when we align everything to the bottom, we only focused on the cap height of the text. That means that there's no extra spacing around the bottom. It will rest exactly on that box. And what's nice is it kind of blends, it gives the a night to eat, drink, and give uh, a, a, something to, to rest on. If we move that description box down, Oh, I just lost a few things on the display. Sorry about that. Let's, uh, there we go. Let's try that one more time. If I move it down, that looks okay, but an IT drinking game is just sort of floating there. It looks a little better when you've got something kind of resting on top of it. It's uh, a, little more, a little more cohesive. So let me uh, switch back to my guide, bring my frames back on just so that you can see what's going on. So we've created the top half, now we're going to create the bottom half, and this part's even easier. We're going to create another text box by clicking the Type tool. I'm going to change my character to – we've got Vesper Libra. That's good. I'm going to do a little lighter, go medium – or excuse me, uh, regular. Uh, do 12 point. We don't need it nearly as big as it was. And let's create another big text frame over here off to the side. Choose the left alignment. Wes, we had a couple of questions real quickly if you don't mind interjecting here. Nikki asks, why does a text box need to be created outside of the document? What happens if you tried to put a text box like on it? Is there a reason for that? That's an excellent question. So when we, when we placed our logo inside the, the, the background color, we're placing an object within another frame. We've got a background color which is basically just a rectangle. So if we click within it, it's, easy, it's, it, it's, it's just a good practice to be in to create objects separate from other objects. If we click on the, the background color, uh, InDesign will think that we want to add text to that, that object itself rather than just placing something on top of it. So this way we create it off to the side, choose our option, make it all look nice, bring it in, place it on top. It's, um, you can definitely drag within uh, the, the, the space that the rectangle, the background color takes up, that's fine. Uh, I just prefer to create them off the side, drag them in that way. I don't, uh, I don't, make, it, I don't make a mistake, have to undo and, and all that. So um, yeah, <laughs> hopefully that explains it. Great. And I bet that keeps you from accidentally moving that background rectangle off of 
the postcard too and then having to realign things. Um, one other quick question just based on what you just showed. Rachel asked, how do you hide the margin and guidelines the way that you just did to show us how the give was anchored to that longer blue line? Another great question. So there's two ways to do it. I'll show you both very, uh, very briefly. Uh, I just did it with keyboard shortcuts just for the sake of time, but uh, because there's uh, inquiring minds want to know, I'll, I'll show you the, the both ways. Uh, up here in the View menu, uh, you have Extras, which, one of which is to hide frame edges. Uh, you can see that I'm, I'm on Windows. So of course, it's a Control-H keyboard shortcut for you Mac users. I believe it's probably uh, Command-H. Uh, you can click that. And now you can see the, 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 the edges around the text frame that I created on the left, and the, the objects that are on the postcard have all disappeared. If I do Control H, and again, I, I assume it's Command H for Mac users. If I hit it again, then they reappear. The same is true for the guides. If I go up to the View menu, there's grids and guides right here. I can choose Hide Guides, uh, and you can see the keyboard shortcut for that is Control, and then the semicolon. I, again, Mac, I assume it's Command instead of Control. I choose that. Those disappear. I, I press uh, Control semicolon, they come back. If I do both Control H and Control semicolon, I get to see it nice and clean, uh, which is great if you're working with somebody else. You've created the design. You want your uh, coworker to take a look, maybe your, your manager, supervisor to approve it, say that looks good, no, let's move it here. But you don't want to bother them with a bunch of lines in the way. They might think it looks worse than it actually does. So those are, those are great ways to just take a quick step back, see how it looks, and then dive back in with your, with your handy guides. And one other quick thing to note, those guides still exist. Things will, you know, your, your objects will, will still snap to them as they have been, even if they're not visible. So you're not really turning them off. You're just hiding them as it says. So excellent question. Were there any others, Becky, to, to field right now? Uh, we can go ahead and move on so we get enough time to show everything. Great. More time for me to talk. Okay. So uh, let's, let's turn our guides and uh, frame edges back on with Control H and Control semicolon. Now they're back on. I've got my text box ready to go. Um, I'm going to choose, let's see, I've got Vesper Libra, rec, uh, regular weight, 12 point font. I've created my big text frame. Now I'm going to type, oh, and I've chosen left align too, which is also very important. I'm going to type just the, the basic information. I'm going to include the date. I'm going to include the location, the, you know, which, which along with that, uh, the address, and then uh, important times for people to know. So registration in this case, what time that is, what time dinner is, and what time the reception is. And of course, this can be anything you want. If it's, uh, if, if it's not a reception, if it's uh, you know, a, a ticket thing, or you know, whatever you need, this is, this is a great spot on the, on the postcard to include whatever you think is necessary. Uh, so let's type uh, Friday. I apologize, there's a lot of text, but I'll try and type fast. 2015, uh, Paramount Theater, uh, 1914 Knobloch Street. And my wife's name, last name is Knobloch, so of course this is my not so subtle way to work somebody I know into this presentation. Uh, if you were here for the uh, Photoshop one, uh, that was my dog, Charlie. So everyone from the house has to find their way into my. Uh, my webinars. So let's say dinner at 6 p.m. and reception at 8 p.m. Great. Uh, one other quick tip too, when you're typing in a text box, right? If you if you're on a roll, you don't want to have to keep going back and forth between keyboard and mouse. If you've typed something in the text box, you want to accept what you've typed. This seems counterintuitive. You can press Escape. It will automatically accept your text changes and then move your uh, switch you back to the selection tool. Escape does seem like maybe something that would cancel what you've done. In this case, it's, it's exactly what you want to do. So kind of strange, but uh, it does save you some time rather than having to click off or click something else. Anyway, if you need those valuable seconds, there you go. Uh, we've chosen our, uh, the, the text that we want. We're going to change the color of it now. So again, we choose the P at the bottom left to choose the color of that. I'm going to come back to my swatches, scroll down, and choose William. It's a little hard to read against this background, but we're going to bring it over to that lighter color in just a moment. Now let's, uh, let's resize this a little bit. I made it kind of big. I'll bring it up, and I'll drag it over. Now just like with the words and give, I'm going to bring this down to, a, to line up with the bottom margin. You can see it's lined up just at the bottom of that. I'll let go. I've almost got it to the right width, but I'm going to bring it back over so that it lines up with the right margin. That looks good. And it's a little too tall, so I'm going to bring it down just a little bit to line up with, with the uh, right underneath the description. Um, that looks okay, but it's not going to catch any eyes. Uh, if you've seen the finished product, you know that we, we're going to call out uh, the, 
the, the date as, as more important. We're going to give that more weight. So let's double click within that text frame and sh select that, that, uh, that top line just like you would in any other uh, word processor. Just select that. We're going to come back to the color, or excuse me, the, uh, the character palette. And we're going to change that one to Open Sans, which is the same uh, typeface that we used for the description of the, and, uh, excuse me, a uh, fundraising event to support our mission. We're going to choose Open Sans. And as you'll notice, as we've been using other uh, certain fonts, uh, when you choose the, uh, from, from that, that typeface dropdown, uh, Vesper Libra, Open Sans there at the top, those are the last ones we've used. If we, cho if we choose other typefaces, those ones will go up to the top too. So I'm going to choose Open Sans. I'm going to give it a little more weight than regular. I'm going to choose that one as bold. I'm going to make it a little bigger. I'm going to make it at 16, which is not an option here. But the nice thing is, if I click off of that again, I can just enter the size that I want. I want 16 point. There we go. Now it's nice and big. My text is still selected. So while I'm doing that, while it's still selected, let's change the color of it too. We can come up to swatches. I'm going to choose, let's see, let's choose big stone. That again is the same color that we used for the background of the logo, the word give, and the background of the description. So once I've done that, I can press escape, a handy, handy key. So that's got a little more weight to it. It calls out. People will see this postcard immediately and think, oh, well, my busy Friday, I can, I can make it. Um, but the, the, the date is right above the location, which is right above the schedule. So things are a little, little packed together. Nice thing is with, with InDesign, if you're creating a, a document that's got a lot of text on it, you don't want it to all go left to right. Fill up the full page. It's kind of hard to read. If you think about a newspaper, you've got columns. That's easier to digest. And in this case, that's what we want to do too. So if you've got your text box, or you, excuse me, your text frame selected, in the upper right here, when you have the selection tool uh, chosen, first of all, it won't show otherwise. If you choose the selection tool and you, and you select your text frame, in the upper right, there's this number of columns uh, option. Currently it's set to 1. It's always set to 1 by default. Any frame has just one column. And change that to 2. Now you'll notice nothing happened in our text box. And that's fine because we don't have enough content currently to fill a second column. It all fits neatly in 1. But we're going to drag that down to fit that to, to, so that everything has to flow into the second uh, column. So if I click that top uh, uh, hanger and drag it down, and drag it down to let's say 0.8. I can get it right there. Oh, a little too much. Yeah, that's pretty close. We've got the, 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 the date on the left. We've got the, the address right below, and we've got the, the other information on the right. Now, by default, everything is still centered uh, vertically because of some other options that we've chosen before. Easy to fix, of course. You know where this is going. You right-click it, text frame options. We can choose the alignment not from the top, but from the bottom. If I, and I still have preview chosen here on the bottom left. If I drag this over and I can see how it previews, that's just what I want. I have three lines on each side. They all line up. I've got the, 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 the date right at the top. That's taking up a lot of space. Perfect. I click OK. I can click off. That looks pretty good. Let's, uh, let's scroll over just a little bit. We can see it without the guides, without the frame edges. All right, that's our front. So now all it's left to do is, uh, is to add information to the back. So I'm going to re-add my frame edges, re-add my guides, and scroll over to the back. We want a nice clear call to action on the back. We want some information you know, to tell people what it is we're doing. Obviously, we want them to give, but why? And we want information that we can, uh, or, or rather elements on the back of the postcard so we can actually mail this if we want. Uh, this is operating on the assumption this is something that people will be receiving in their, in their mailboxes. But of course, you can design a postcard that will fit neatly on a table and tell people about your organization or your library, things like that. It doesn't have to include these elements, but I'm operating on the assumption that you'll be mailing stuff. So I'm going to add those uh, in just a moment. But first, let's have our call to action. So, I'm going to create another uh, uh, text frame. I'm going to click the Type tool. I'm going to create a box off to the side once again. Let's click and drag that. I'll type, Join us. That's what we want people to do, Join us. And do a left alignment. And let's select our text. That's not quite big enough. Come to the, uh, the, the Character Palette. We've got Vesper Libre chosen. That's great. That's consistent. Change that to, uh, let's say, Bold. And we're going to make it a little bigger, 36 point. Looks good. We'll hit Escape to accept those changes. One more time, right-click, Text Frame Options. 
we're going to choose vertical alignment center. We're going to choose our baseline options. You know, this is going to change it from ascent to cap height. Now, this isn't something you always have to do. I find that it's best to change this field when you when you have uh, a text object that you just need to um, that isn't going to be like long copy, for example. So in the cases before, we had a nice to eat, drink, and give. Those three options, or those three objects, just sort of serve as as a function. They don't actually, you know, have to be presented like a like a, a readable document. They're just you know, something to call out, be large, be a visual element on the on the page. That's why I like to choose cap hide because I get that extra option around the spacing of it. If you have multiple lines of text, it's going to be nice to to give it that extra breathing room. Leave it as a scent or whatever other options you want. But in this case, cap height is is my is my preference. So we're going to click OK on that. I'm going to drag that over so that it hits the uh, upper left margin. And then I'm going to resize this to live within that box. There we go. So it's it's centered. So it's it, within the size that I've, I've I've prescribed. It's got a little space on the top and bottom. It's got some breathing room. Now let's add uh, let's add a little some little body copy to it. So we'll click the type tool again. We've got Vesper Libra at regular at 12. That looks pretty good. So let's create another text frame. And rather than fill this with text, let's choose left alignment on that too. Rather than fill this with text, I'm just going to hit escape. That seems a little counterintuitive. Why would you just create a blank box? Well, let's drag this over to this spot and I'll show you. So we've got, say, right about here, and I'll fill it about two and a half inches wide, which is about half the size of it, and let's say one and a quarter inch. So we've got this, this, this empty box, and this is going to be where you describe what it is your, your, your fundraising event will be. And rather than waste time watching me type out a whole explanation of what the event is, uh, I'll show you another feature of, of InDesign that I really like. If you're just laying things out and you don't have your copy ready, if someone else is writing it and you're the, you're the person who's tasked with designing it, you don't have their copy, what do you do? Uh, InDesign has got you covered under the Type menu, Fill with Placeholder Text. This will fill in just random Latin, sort of lore myths, and if you're familiar with that, uh, to, to the exact uh, dimensions of your text frame. You don't have to worry about it. You know that it's the right size. You've specified how it's going to look. Now when someone brings you the text or you figure out what it's going to say later, you can always come in, fill it out as you need it. But for right now, it will give you at least a visual sense of what things will look like. So super handy. Um, one other thing I want to change on this, and this is a default in InDesign, if you change the, if you click the uh, paragraph palette, hyphenate is on by default. Personally, I'm not a fan of hyphenation. It looks a little funky. I like words to be all full length. If it's too long for the line, let's bring it over to the next line. So uncheck that, and you can see it brought that over. So that looks good. We'll click off of that. So we've got a call to action at the top. We've got the um, we've got the, the description below it. Now we're going to add the uh, the RSVP text. So in this case, I'm assuming that maybe you've got a, a, a place for, or a, for your attendees to uh, RSVP online. Maybe you've got an Evite or a Facebook event, something like that. If you don't, that's fine. You want to use a, a phone number, call us to RSVP. That's fine too. This line will work for any of that. So we're going to click the, te uh, the, the text tool again. Make sure we've got our uh, character set, regular 12 points. That looks good. Choose left alignment. And let's create a text frame off the side and type RSVP at organization.org slash event. Very exciting. Uh, now we'll drag this over just beneath our description text. We've got that little space in between which is nice just for some breathing room. Let's choose our text frame options. We're going to uh, center this as well like we have been in the past. And choose our baseline options once again, cap height. This is just a one-liner. Serves as, a, as an object on a page. It's not meant for long-form reading. I like cap height. Great. Now let's drag this bottom right corner up to, the, to this space here. It fills in that space very nicely, very neatly. You can see it. I'll turn off the, uh, the guide so you can get a sense of how it's looking so far. No, no frame edges. That's looking good. It's filling in the, the left side nicely. We'll turn those back on. And the last thing, we're going to add uh, some, some contact information. If anyone has questions, how do they get a hold of you, let's add that at the bottom. So one more time, we're going to choose the Type tool. 
going to click and drag a box on the right. And let's just type organization name and a fake address. Second, oops, excuse me, Second Street, Allentown. State is not applicable. Three four three four. What did I say? Four five. And then underneath that, a phone number. The, of course, we're in a movie, so every number is five five five. All right. Great. Hit Escape to accept our changes. Let's resize that up because it's a little bigger than we need. And we'll drag that down here. And I'm going to line it up to the bottom, uh, bottom left margin, bottom left of the text frame to the bottom left of the, of the margin of the, of the page. And it's still a little tall, so I'm going to drag this down right to about there. And then bring this over so that everything is neatly the same width within that column. Uh, it's because of the space above it in the font, and, um, and the fact that it's, it's, uh, it's top aligned, it looks like it's in the center. Let's fix that. Right click it. Then choose Text Frame Options. And here we go, choose the alignment to the bottom. If I drag this away, you can see at the on, on the left here, you have the preview. Now it's aligned at the bottom. It gives a little more breathing room. It's independent from the RCP at URL. And uh, that looks good. So we say OK. So we've got our left side done. Now all that we need to do is add a little divider line in the center. Add a stamp box and some lines for the address, and we're all set. So this is going to introduce a new tool we haven't covered yet. Uh, pretty simple though, if you've used any other uh, graphic design or uh, or drawing applications, even stuff like uh, like Microsoft Word will have these same tools. We're going to create a line. So there's a line tool just a little up from the rectangle tool that we've been using before. Just click on that, and let's see. Just like with the rectangle that we created before where we specified a certain size, I'm going to do that here too. So rather than clicking and dragging, I'll just click off to the side. Now actually I'll tell you what, let's, let's do this. I know the size I want already. Let's just drag one down to about two and a half inches. Yeah, that's pretty close. Now if you can if you can see this on your screen, it might be hard to. My line is not entirely straight. It's slightly off to the side. And if I move around, of course, it'll it'll move with me. While I'm still holding down the, 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 the mouse button, if I hold down shift, it snaps into place. It's a perfectly straight line. If I keep moving, it will do a 45, 90, and so on degree angle. This is great if you don't want slight variances in your in your shapes. If you want it exactly straight, this will do it. So I'm going to measure that at 2.5 and finally let go. Now we've got a line. And it looks like it's got some width to it, but that's just the, the, the guide for it. There's no actual uh, uh, weight to this line until we add it. So in that case, we're going to come over to Stroke, which is just a sort of graphic design way of saying a border. Click Stroke. You can see the weight is zero, which means there's nothing applied to it. If I change that up to one point, you can see on your screen it's added a little bit. There's that blue line is now around the black line. If we, co if we click our selection tool, and then choose a line, I'll show you this. This is nice. If we, if we click a line, this gives you ways to align objects on the page, either in relation to other objects or to the page itself or a lot of other options. Right now we're just going to focus on how it aligns to, well, on the page. We want it right in the center. So if I click this one here, this uh, upper left, it's the second one from the left, align horizontal centers. Oh, excuse me. Let me try that again. That's my problem. Let me back up. Sorry about that. Like I said, you can align it to other objects on the page. Uh, if, if I've selected, say, text objects or, or images, I can align it to that. If I want it to be in the center of something else, that's an option. By default, it's aligned to selection. I want to align to page. I skipped ahead, so my apologies. Choose align to page first. Now if I click that, that align horizontal centers, now <laughs> it aligned to the first page. Sorry about that. Let me just make this a little simpler. I'm going to drag this over, save some time, right to that spot. Done and done. It's also a little too high up. I want to bring it down. That looks like it's pretty close. And again, with other options I can make it exactly right, but for the sake of time, let's, let's keep it moving. Um, now we're going to add a stamp box in the upper right. So again, we go back to our rectangle tool, click that. Now before we get started with that, in the past, we've, we've created rectangles that had a color filled in and no border. This time we're going to do the opposite. We're going to create a box that has nothing, no color filled in. It's, it's, it's 
clear in the center, but it's got uh, a box around it. So if you just imagine, just a, if you draw a square, that's what we're going for. So if you come back to your uh, color properties in here, down here on the, on the bottom left, we've got a color filled in, which is the fill. We've chosen that. If you click it, you'll get the color option here. I want to bring that, let's see, there's this box here, this, this none option. So whatever color type you've chosen, if you're, and I'll cover this later, but if you've chosen CMYK, RGB color, some Pantone colors, any of that, this will always be an option. You've always got this gradient, and you can choose none, which is what I want. So now I've chosen no color, no, uh, fill, no stroke color. But let's change that stroke color to something. So we click on this other box right behind fill. And if you watch carefully, it brings forward just a little bit. It's really subtle, so it's, always, it's easy to miss. But click stroke. And over here I've got the choice for black. I choose that. So now you can see there's slash through the fill, color around the, the stroke. That's what I want. So I've got my rectangle uh, chosen. I'm going to click without dragging. I'll just click and choose a 0.7 inch by 0.7 inch size. And that's roughly the size of a stamp. Of course, it doesn't have to be exact. The stamp's going to cover it, but that's fine. Hit OK. I'll choose my selection tool, and I'll drag this up into the upper right corner. There we go. Last thing to do, let's go back to our line tool. I'm going to create some horizontal lines this time. Click that. I'm going to create one, let's see, let's do it about, let's do about two inches wide. So I let go, and of course at that time I was also holding down shift like I did before to create a perfectly horizontal straight line. Click the selection tool and just drag this over. Let's do it about here. Now if I've created an object that I want and I want to duplicate it multiple times, rather than having to, to, to do it by hand each time, I can just duplicate it, drag it down, and that works great. And the way I do that on a PC, if I hold Alt, you can see my cursor changes to a duplication symbol. I can drag this down, and you can see there's all these little handy guides to guide me along the way. I drag it down to my next guide, let go, and I'll do it one more time. Right down to there. Great. So now I'm going to turn off my frame edges, my guides. I can take a look, and that's a, that's a, that's a functional postcard. And there you go. That's, that's the, the design portion of it. And we'll cover a few more details later, but uh, Becky's got a little, uh, little to add. Great. Thank you for that, Wes. And you know, we've had a conversation going on in the back end um, with one participant highlighting that you know, there's some concern about where the address needs to be located on the back side of a postcard because the U.S. Postal Service has barcode scanner technology these days. So you may – I would always recommend, let's say, <laughs> that um, you check on the U.S. Postal Service's guidelines before you do any design to make sure that your you know, keeping areas blank that they need blank, that you are putting the stamp in the area that they need, um, that you are making sure that recipient mailing addresses are appropriately located because those change every couple of years. And I know it is not a tough thing to Google the U.S. Postal Service's postal guidelines. So just make sure you are double checking those kinds of things because they do change regularly. And we wouldn't want to see you send out a postcard that gets redirected back to your own office and not to the intended recipient. So. With that, we have a few other questions. Um, but before we do that, I would love it if you could share some of your tips. Um, well, actually, sorry, one question I want you to answer while you're still showing your desktop. Um, how do you decide where to put the guides that you built into the template before you start? Do you set a certain amount of space around the outside that's your margin? Um, and sort of what are those standards? Are there best practices on setting up the guides? That's a really good question. Uh, so guys, in this case, I added these guides along the way. They look like it's already been figured out, but that was because I did a lot of trial and error in designing this postcard. And once I got it to look the way it did, I added the guides you know, for, for, the, for the, the sake of, of you fine folks uh, watching. Um, when you're actually designing something from scratch, it's hard to know where those are going to go. Let me show you one, one nice way to, to, to get a sense of where they, where they might be useful. Um, if you, I'm going to create a new document here. And I'm just going to create a basic letter so that you can see something else. Um, under the Layout menu, let's see, under – I'm trying to remember it now. Let's see, Ruler Guides. 
no, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Create guides. Uh, I might have done that a little fast. Let me do it one more time just so that folks can see. It's layout menu, create guides. And I've got my preview box checked. I can choose a number of rows and columns that are the exact same width across with a certain what they call a gutter, which is basically the space between your columns and your rows. If I choose any number of that, let's say I want uh, 12 rows across, I change to the next one. You can see those lines show up. And I'll say I want to do 12 columns across. Now I've got a lot of guides. Um, and that may be too many for you. You can scale back, add more as you need. It, it creates a nice grid. And if you, again, going back to the newspaper example, which is always a great, uh, you know, rules of thumb to follow for newspapers are good for, for any print meeting because they do it daily. They know how everything works. Um, it's always great to have a, a grid to work from first. If things take up, let's say, three columns here and one column there, and then this one takes up the full width, your eye may not notice that things are on a grid layout, but your brain will interpret it as a nice clean design and it's something that's more appealing rather than some sort of kind of chaotic spacing. So always nice to have a grid to start with. Um, and if you along the way, if you decide you need fewer or more, you can always come back once I've accepted these changes. I say, well, that's way too many. I just need six by six. If I go back to layout, create guides, and I choose remove existing ruler guides. Now they would disappear. I can choose 6 by 6. Much cleaner design. I like this better. I can work with this. So it's always a good way to start when you've got, uh, when you've got, a, blank temp when you've got a blank page uh, to create some guides for lining things up with other, other objects on the, on the page. Great. And before we have you stop uh, sharing your screen, can you show one more time where people can select uh, the colors and find the Adobe color themes that are sort of pre-available that mesh well together so people can, you know, if you don't have your specific colors for your organization or you're not sure what would go nicely with it, you can often find those uh, recommended pairings and groupings from within Adobe's custom color themes. And you can also customize and save them for your own organization's needs. Definitely, yeah. And this is something uh, I've, just, I've discovered recently. There's a lot of uh, nice features and, and options within a lot of the Adobe products that as you begin to use them more, you'll always discover something new. Oh, I don't have to do six steps in order to get that one thing done. There's a little feature for it that I might have missed. So in this case, uh, if you move under the, uh, the Window menu, there's the Color uh, option that flies out. Uh, Adobe Color Themes is the one that I mentioned at the top. If you choose that, it brings you this palette comes to uh, the Create tab first where you can choose a lot of options uh, based on – so if I know that I want the dominant color in this to be red, which is, which is the one that, that's chosen by default, I can choose complementary colors, analogous colors. I can choose – let me show you a triad, which will find other colors that are based on them. This is all color theory stuff, so I don't you know, wait, wait too heavily into it. But uh, if you want shades of that color, so I want darker ones, I want lighter ones, but they're all red, that sort of thing, you can, you can browse around. And of course you can change the, the color that you're starting from too by just choosing from that color slider. So if I want uh, maybe this lighter, I want something a little more blue, etc. Uh, the ones that I chose for this were under the Explore tab. And let's see, I think my screen might be – there we go, I'm hesitating to show you. So under the Explore tab, there's a lot of these uh, palettes – or excuse me, uh, swatches that are already chosen that are complementary to one another. Um, they've all got fancy names like Sandy Stone, Beach Ocean Diver, uh, Honey Pot. Um, under this drop-down you've got Most Popular, which is where I always start because I want to do what's popular. Um, and so from there I found that neutral blue one. So as you can see, this is um, – I think I called that one like Big Stone and William and Tara and all these other colors. Um, those, are, those are all from neutral blue, which I found through the Adobe Color Themes. And I believe that's a feature that's only more recent within uh, Adobe Creative Cloud. If you don't have uh, Creative Cloud, if you're working from uh, one of the Creative Suite versions, there's a lot of great sites online that will do pretty much the same thing for you. They will provide you with palettes uh, and, and even include photos with a lot of those colors in them so that you can see how it will all look together. If you're looking for a beach theme, you want to save – you know, if you're working as a conservation group, you want to save the beaches, you want to have a beach color theme, that sort of thing. Um, you, you can always find those. And I'll, and I'll share some of those resources in a little bit too. But I think we want to get to maybe some other questions here. Before we leave the color palette, Lisa asks, how do you pick specific Pantone matching colors, like the ones that you may have from a printer for your logo or your organizational colors. Maybe you have two or three colors that you use. How do you match those? Um, because you can save – you see that little tab that says My Themes? If you're using the same set of colors 
for most of your collateral, you can save it there so that you can find it every time without having to look for it over again or search for all of those colors. But how do you go about matching? Really good question too. So I'm going to close out of this color themes actually, and I'll show you something within color itself. So um, for those of you that may not know, uh, I'm going to explain a couple things just about how color works both in print and screen. If you already know this, my apologies uh, for, for going so over something you already know. But for, uh, for anything that appears on screen, um, your computer will, will, will measure those colors in three values, red, green, and blue. Those are RGB values. Um, if you choose on the color palette this, this flyout, you can choose RGB. I can choose the, the value of red, green, and blue that I want to appear in something. Uh, for print, for anything that's going to be actually physically, you know, you can hold in your hand, um, it, it operates off of CMYK. So that's cyan, uh, magenta, yellow, and the K stands for black. Um, you can just go figure. It uh, stands for key, but that's kind of a nerdy aside. I won't go into why. Uh, but you can choose that one uh, here as well. And so there's your, your CMY and K values. And the same is true for, for lab if you're looking at uh, luminance. And I never use lab, so I'm kind of blanking on what the other two stand for. But you've got options for your colors. One other nice thing you can do, uh, if you come up to your swatches, so you mentioned Pantone. Under the swatches, you have a fly out here. You can load swatches. Um, now if you've got a, and I don't have one handy, so I can't actually demonstrate this very well, but if you've got uh, a Pantone colors that are pre-selected, uh, in, in saved into a color swatch file, you can load those in. If that's something that your printer has provided to you, here's our colors, pick from these. This is where you would open that file and load them in. Uh, and they would appear in this list um, underneath the ones that are pre-selected uh, for you to choose. So uh, your, your Pantone colors would not appear as a CMYK value. They would probably say Pantone 110, green, or whatever the, the, the how are they've been labeled. But that's, that's the place to, to choose those. So hopefully that, that helps you there. Great. Thank you so much for that, Wes. Um, we're going to go ahead and stop sharing just to so show you some of the additional resources. But before we do that, can you show us what the, uh, the postcard looked like again so that people get the final view of it? And like I said, we will include the final version of this as an InDesign file that you can go in and customize, move things around, change the colors, do what you want with it. Um, so that you have the opportunity to make it your own. And Wes has one other thing to add about this. Sure. One other quick thing. Uh, so we talked about printers. Uh, one, one great feature that, uh, that Adobe uh, InDesign has built into it is the ability to package everything. So in this case, we've got one InDesign file, which is this whole design. We've got the logo file though. That's a separate file. Um, we've also got fonts that are included that maybe your printer doesn't have. So if you just send him or her an InDesign file, uh, and they don't have the fonts, and they don't have the images or the logo or whatever, they're going to get something that's just a bunch of text that doesn't look anywhere near what you designed. So the way to send that over to them under the File menu, there is the Package feature. This will, in, this will save a, a separate file that includes everything. It will embed the fonts. It will uh, specify the exact colors that you've chosen, and it will package up any, uh, any files like images or in this case the logo, which is a vector file, for the, um, for the printer to use. They'll get everything in one nice tidy package, hence the name package. So that's the place to do that. Um, and then, then your, your printer may even request that, or they might make it easy on you and just say, just send us a PDF, in which case everything's already packaged nicely too. So if they have, depending on what their requirements are, uh, you may have to package it, in which case uh, that's, that's where you find that feature. Great. And with that in mind, I'd like to go ahead and have a stop sharing because Wes is going to share some tips on working with printers, but we want to show this glossary. We know we used some terminology today that may not be totally familiar to everybody, especially if you're not a professional designer or printer yourself. Uh, these are some of the terms that Wes used. And you know, we talked about the RGB and the CMYK. Um, anything you want to say about these specific terms that people should be aware of? Sure, yeah. So I mentioned RGB colors. Again, that's just for screen, whether you're looking at your monitor, your cell phone, anything. That's, that's the, the way you're going to choose those colors. CMYK, of course, is for anything that's printed. Um, in some cases, the colors may have slight variances if you choose. If you enter it as an RGB value, you need to change it to CMYK. You can do that within InDesign, uh, just from that same colors uh, uh, palette, just change from CMYK to RGB or, or vice versa. Um, but again, you're sending it to printer. You want to make sure all your colors are CMYK. Um, one other uh, quick pedantic note, uh, typeface versus font. Um, not that this, may, this may not come up, but I like to spread 
spread the gospel about this just because it's a pet peeve of mine. Typeface is the, is the set of characters of the common style. So if you think of uh, Arial or Times New Roman, that's your typeface. Your font is the typeface plus anything like bold, uh, you know, 12 point, uh, italic, anything like that. So uh, that's, that's just more for, for me to feel better that I've told other people about that. Um, stroke, of course, we, we covered that. That's the border around any object. Uh, it's, it's a terminology you'll find in, in, in graphic design, especially within, um, within Adobe products. You'll see that in, uh, in Photoshop, in Illustrator, in Design, any of those. They all say stroke when they mean border. So if that's what you're looking for, that's what it's called. Uh, we also covered at the top uh, the, the, the concept of a bleed. And again, that's the, when an object goes beyond the frame. We created a background color that just went to the frame of the page. If your printer needs it to go an extra uh, inch all around, you can create that bleed. Um, at the very beginning when you're creating your document, just specify one inch all around. It will give you a dotted you know, little margin space and you can drag to that. Uh, and of course, this one's familiar to anyone who's uh, ever, ever painted, like painting your house. Uh, matte versus gloss. Matte, of course, is a flatter finish when it comes to a printed document. Gloss is your shinier one. There are a lot of other options in there, like metallic and a semi-gloss and like all these other you know, options in between. Um, but always, always consider that when you're, when you're printing something. If you have something that's supposed to be really bright, shiny pop, Maybe a gloss is better. If it's a little more subtle, you want it to be, you know, depending on the, the content of it, if it's something a little more, uh, has a little more gravity to it, maybe a matte is more, is more the way to go. Great. And then, you know, the best practices that we can share are really talking to your printer first because learning about the different card stocks available for printing things like postcards, um, if there are guidelines on, you know, where you need to place stamps and things like that, your printer is likely to be up to speed on all of that. So you know, you're working with them. They're your friend on this project, whatever it might be. Whatever you're printing, if you're printing it in-house, you don't have that luxury, but it is great to have somebody who is a professional printer that you work with from time to time time to help you answer those kinds of questions, show you the card stocks, talk to you about templates. They might be able to provide you with templates of sizes that you already need so you can just plop things in and you've got those guidelines already set up for you. Wes is going to add to this as well. Yeah, sorry, I think you just covered it at the end there, but just to, just to reiterate that uh, printers will often uh, have a PDF ready for you that you can just load in to InDesign or, or any other design program that already has their their, more, their margins, their, you know, mat, or their, uh, excuse me, their, their bleeds and all that. So it's always nice to contact them first. They can give you whatever you need and start from, rather than have to do it all over later. Great. That's good advice. And you know, I did a quick search for postcard designs, USPS, and lots of InDesign templates popped up too. So you can always just go to Google or go to Bing or whatever your search engine is that you're using and search for templates because there are a lot of free ones. There are also free templates built into some of the Adobe Creative Suite that you can just take if you're building a flyer or a postcard. You may be able to find free templates that you can just open up that have those guidelines, have bleeds built in, have cut lines, things like that. Um, so keep that in mind too. We are at the top of our webinar time. So I just want to quickly show these are some of the resources that Wes used to gather free fonts. So the um, Vesper Libre font and uh, the other one that I'm open sans. Thank you. I couldn't remember the name. He found from Google Web Fonts. But here are some other places to get color palettes, free images, things that you can use in designing beautiful collateral for your own organization's needs. I also want to just point you again to the links that you'll get in that PowerPoint for Creative Cloud individual memberships for the general Adobe donation program, and then some other resources about the Adobe Creative Cloud offer. We did a webinar last month on a crash course showing the different elements and pieces of Adobe Creative Cloud, and then some Adobe InDesign videos from Adobe TV. They have tutorials on how to do a whole bunch of things using InDesign. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention again the Celebrate Adobe Creative Cloud contest that's happening with us right now. Uh, through October, October where Adobe and TechSoup are partnered and winning. You can win prizes every month. We are selecting three prizes with a grand prize is $1,000. Uh, other prizes include things like an Adobe Creative Cloud subscription and other Adobe products. And you can enter any collateral that you've created, um, whether that's images that you've edited, video files, whether it's um, flat printed things like what you may have created in Illustrator or InDesign. You can enter those just by sharing on the Facebook or, uh, link there. Uh, 
using the hashtag on Twitter or Instagram to link to your different submissions. And we'll be welcoming people to vote on those as well. So you watch for those links in the follow-up email. If you could go ahead, those of you still on the line with us, and chat in one thing that you learned today that you are going to try to implement. We would appreciate that or that you've learned that you are going to work on on your own. And like I said, we will do our best to get you some of these files so you can customize them and change them, and we will make sure that they are available to you for use with earlier versions of Adobe Creative Suite in addition to the Creative Cloud version. We did have a couple of other questions that came in just asking if – and Wes, I don't know if you know if you can change the default values under that text frame options box. I know that you can save a lot of custom things that you use frequently, but I don't know if that's an area where you can customize. He's shaking his head like he's not sure. So I think we'll have to get back to you on that one. We had a couple of different people that asked about that. Um, before you leave us today, we'd like to invite you to join us for our upcoming webinars. We have a whole spate of opportunities to join us. Next week we'll be talking about Windows 10. So if you're thinking about upgrading your organization, whether you're a library or a nonprofit, you can join us to see some of the features in that and learn about the different upgrade options from totally completely free upgrades to various paid and donated options available to you. We'll be talking about Giving Tuesday and 10 Tactical Tips on September 3rd. We'll be introducing QuickBooks Online, which is coming soon to a TechSoup near you. Um, you can also then learn about managing mobile devices and checking them out if you are with a public library joining us. And we'll be talking about how to make your grant requests sparkle. And then we'll be talking about different donated and discounted technologies from not only TechSoup, but organizations like Independent Sector and Good360. So join us for any of those. Thank you so much Wes, and thank you to all of the folks who helped on the back end, and thank you to our participants mostly for joining us today. We are really glad to have you on. And lastly, I would like to thank ReadyTalk, our webinar sponsor, who provides the use of this platform each week so we can present these webinars. You can learn about their donation program with TechSoup at TechSoup.org slash ReadyTalk. And can you please take a moment to complete the post-event survey after this webinar closes out so we can continue to improve our webinar programs. Thanks so much everyone. Have a terrific day. Bye-bye.